Institute is called the Khan Institute, and I put flyers in the back of the room because uh, we have our annual event, the Solution Building Couples uh, Therapy Summit, with Dr. Adam Frower and Dr. Sarah Smock coming down to Fort Worth to be the keynote presenters, and we're super duper excited about it. Uh, I've been doing this work for quite a while, and I've developed a tremendous passion for working with couples, and that only defeats my passion for working with adolescents, which we're going to talk about today. The other announcement that I wanted to have is I brought a couple of books with me. These are two books that I have published. Um, this one got published last week, and then this one got published last fall. This one is uh, Solution Building in Couples Therapy, and this one is called The Solution Focused Marriage, Five Simple Habits That Will Bring Up the Best in Your Relationship. And I'm really excited because as of last night, both of these books cracked uh, the Kindle's top 50 sales list. So I'm really excited. So buy them. I got kids I gotta put to college. I don't have any kids. Actually, I shouldn't even, shouldn't even say that. I gotta apologize to my wife that that actually even came out of my mouth. <laughs> um, so anyway, that is a little bit about me. And I'd like to learn a little bit about you guys because I haven't, I don't know many people here. So just by show of hands, where do people work? I know that predominantly I would guess that we have people who work in schools private practices and agencies. So how many people here work in schools? Oh wow, quite a bit. And how many work in private practice? A couple. And how many work in agencies? The rest of you. Very good. And how many people are uh, familiar with solution-focused work? Very cool. And how familiar would you guys say you are? Ten represents that you are best friends with Steve DeShazer and Insu Kimberg and Zero, and this is the first time you've ever heard the word solution and focused combined. We would just say you guys are Six, seven, three, good. Okay, well, um, well, we're going to get right into it. I want to show you guys a video clip that, you know, when you start learning solution-focused therapy, it's really a way of, like, looking at the world differently and looking at your clients differently and, and just really thinking differently. And as a result of that, you start seeing the world, like, movies and things kind of jump out at you. So I want to show you a movie clip that I think encapsulates solution-focused work. Can we dim the lights a little because I think there'll be a glare? Um, and then we'll get right into it. Should be. So, when I was introduced to the solution focused approach, uh, I was actually working for this agency. So to be quite honest, it's a little bit weird to be standing in image on board uh, because I was working here when I was introduced to solution focused ways of working, and um, I didn't really trust it. Like, I was very uh, cognitive behavioral at the time. I was doing a job called MST. You guys know what that is? Multi-systemic therapy. They do it here in the Metro Mark. And um, had really kind of bought in to these problem-focused ways of working with clients and noticed that it was effective. Like, you know, focusing on problems is effective. We know that. And we've been doing it for 100 years, so on and so on. But once I learned about the solution-focused approach, I was instantly, like, drawn to it. There was something about it that just made complete and total sense to my head. But I couldn't believe that this simplistic way of working was actually true. And while I was working here, I'll never forget this kid. I tell people all the time that clients taught me to trust this way of working, not my professor, even though I had a great professor. I was working with this kid who was going to the DAP over here, less than a couple miles away, or less than a mile away, really. And I went and met with the counselor. This was five, six years ago, seven years ago, I guess. Went and met with the counselor. And they said, this kid has been to school this year 17 times. 17 times, and we were in February. So that school year, he'd been to school 17 times. So sticking with the message from that clip, I heard 17 as a lot. Like, why not zero? Like, if you're going to skip school, why not just quit? Like, why did you get up and come 17 times? So I asked him that. And anything I would do 17 times is kind of a lot. So why did you do it 17 times? And he starts describing that on the days where he was coming to school, he knew he was going to get a good meal. Mm -hmm. And no one had asked him. No one had ever asked this kid what drove him to come to school. So I talked to the school staff and I said, is there a way that we could provide meals so this kid could eat? He was in a very difficult situation at home. The school said yes, and he finished that school year. And a couple of years later, I get an email saying he graduated from high school and going to TCC. Because we saw it differently. 
One method of approaches would tell us that 17 represents a lot of school stigma. But when we look at the world anew, we look at the world differently, 17 is actually a lot of times to do something like that. And all I did was ask him, what made you do this? And he said, because we have good meals on those days. Spaghetti and meatballs was his favorite meal. Is there any way we can provide this for him more often? The wonderful staff over there said, of course we could. He finished the school year. A couple years later, I get an email saying he graduated high school and won a TCC. So this training is going to be about picking up different pieces of data and how to use them. So a few words about what we're going to do today. First, you don't have to write down every word of the PowerPoint slide. I'm going to, if you go to that website, uh, you'll be able to download them. Uh, we're going to focus on three things you can do with adolescents and families, just because we only have a couple hours, so I don't, I don't have the whole time to go through everything. But we're going to talk about future-focused language when you're working with clients. We're going to talk about the presence of change talk. We're going to talk about how to invite client strengths into the conversation in a usable, respectful way. And then I'm going to use a video case example of me working with a real teenager. Uh, I have consent from this particular family to uh, use this, this tape in a training, but I'd like you to respect their confidentiality if you should happen to know, to know these guys. Okay? Um, a little bit more about me is... Uh, I've been traveling around for quite some time now. I, I got my start working right here at MH Barnes. It was my first job as a clinician. Um, I eventually ended up working at Lena Pope Home. Uh, I hope that's an okay word to say in this building. Uh, and then I started working in private practice where I've been ever since. I've since traveled to Denmark, Sweden, Germany, Canada, uh, England, where else? I don't know. Around the world, giving lectures on using the solution folks approach. And I really, really enjoy it. I really, it means a lot to me. I've written three books now. Um, my mentors have been Chris Iveson, Bill O'Hanlon, and then Linda Metcalf, who I know some of you guys know. So, <clears throat> first time I was flying over to England, I made the biggest mistake I've ever made in my life. You'll notice about me that I'm ridiculously hyper. I can't stand still at all. You guys will see me pacing all over the place. And the first time I went to England, I did not properly charge my computer. So I had all these movies loaded up on my computer about halfway through the flight, went dead. And by halfway through, I meant like four hours in to a nine-hour flight, right? So I spent a couple hours just staring at some guy's head the whole time, trying to go to sleep, and I couldn't. I'm just staring at the guy's, back of this guy's head. So I get to England, and I start telling him. Can I turn? Sorry, we left you, yeah. We turned out. Okay. There you go. So I get to England. Next up. I get to England and I start telling the guys that invited me over there about my horrible flight. So of course they pick on me. My friends over there are all in their 60s and 70s and they said, you know, before these technology things we had books. <laughs> so you might want to get a book. And he gave me a book called Time to Think, written by this woman called Nancy Klein. So on the way back, I'm reading this book, which I love. And as I'm reading this book, I saw this quote that says, people think better throughout a meeting when you start off the meeting about something true and positive about their work that pertains to the group. So ever since that moment, that's how we've started out. So I'd like you guys to get into, get into pairs, and I want you to think of what drove you to be in this field, tell your partner about it, and then what have you done in the past few days that fits with those original drives? What else? And what else? So I want you to tell them three things that drove you to be in this field, and what have you done in the past few days that fit with those original drives? What else? And what else? Okay, so get in pairs and go. <laughs> solution focused therapy, the solution building work, it's a very conversational practice, which I'm going to demonstrate to you. So I think it's my job that I should be able to explain it and demonstrate it, and you guys have to practice it. So this is an approach you have to practice to get better at. You have to keep working at it. It's a very conversational approach. So we're going to do a lot of exercises today, or as many as you can do in an hour and a half, I suppose. But uh, I'm going to try to explain it. I'm going to use a case example to demonstrate it, again, of me working with a real client, and ask you guys to do some work in group. So I hope that's okay, and I appreciate you guys willing to do it. So the first thing I'll say about Salute Focus Therapy is it's simple. And Sue Kimberg was recent, frequently asked, what it was that she was most proud of about the solution focused approach. And the answer was usually because it's simple. It's simply about asking the next question. Okay? We're going to talk a lot about that. And it's based on curiosity and not being nosy. I have to ask questions that are related to the client's 
reason for being in my office because that fits with my remit for being their therapist. I can't be nosy and venture off and ask questions that aren't my business, okay? Mm -hmm. The way I like to see that is, um, like if I go to the dentist, and this actually did happen to me one time, if I go to the dentist and I've got the meanest dentist in the world who takes pleasure in causing people oral pain, <laughs> literally. She's wonderful, nice person, but when you walk out of the office like drooling, she laughs. So one day I had a baseball game and I hurt my knee and I came into her office really anxious because I knew she was going to kill me and I'm limping. So she starts asking me about what happened to my knee. Being nosy. It's not your business. You're here to work on my teeth. I'm anxious. And think about that, right? Clients come to our office anxious. They're nervous, right? So we have to stick to what our remit is. We have to stick to what our job is. And it makes us curious and not nosy. In order to do this, you have to have two very basic skills. And the good news is we've had these skills since childhood. The first one is every person must take a turn. This creates an equality of contribution. Now you would be surprised at how often we violate this rule as adults. But every single person in the room must take their turn to contribute to the conversation. When I was a kid, I grew up in, uh, well, I was born in Chicago, grew up in Boston. When I'd go visit my grandmother, me and my brothers thought that adult conversations meant you got to cut each other off. <laughs> what we thought. Yeah. So when we were kids, we used to pretend to be adults, and we'd say, okay, talk. And in the middle of the talking, we'd jump in and come on. Because <laughs> kids somehow understand you can't talk until it's your turn. But as adults, we don't follow that rule. We've got to get back to that. I'm currently doing research with a woman by the name of Janet Bobolus. And Dr. Bobolus is reviewing one of my therapy tapes that I did with a couple. And she called me a couple of weeks ago and she said, we found the most fascinating thing in your therapy tape. So oh, what is it? Now this woman has been reviewing language. She's a linguist, not a therapist. She's a linguist. She's been re reviewing language for almost 40 years. And they've never seen this before in a, in a couple session. And what they found was at the 30 minute mark, which is how much they had transcribed to analyze for this research, the conversation I was having with this couple, the man had talked 67 times and the woman had spoken 69 times. Because I'm working really hard to ensure that each person contributes equally. Now, somebody's turn might be longer than another, like one person might be more wordy than another, but they each must take their turn. This is very important. And lastly, each contribution builds on what was last said. So I have to use the client content in the construction of my question. This is very, very important. In solution-focused therapy, we, as close as we possibly can to using the client's exact language, okay? So here's an example. You're gonna be pissed when they get home. Like 60 million people watch that video. Those kids are done. You got a picture of me in my diaper and one one sock? Like I'm not happy about that. But pre-verbally, they're following the rules of communication. They're taking turns. They're waiting patiently for their turn. They're focused on each other. They're matching pace. They're matching conversation structure. They're matching tone. And they don't yet know how to construct words. This is how long we've known how to communicate. But as adults, we have broken brains, right? My wife will tell you I have a broken brain because sometimes as she's explaining things to me, I start constructing what I'm going to say next. You guys do that? I had an argument this weekend. I was just telling somebody just this morning. I had an argument this weekend with my wife. True story. My wife thinks that what we should cut out of our budget to make sure that we're saving money is groceries. <laughs> that make any sense to anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> well, are you saying something about my weight? <laughs> I was trying to explain to her, like, like, how am I going to eat? And her response was literally, figure it out. And as I'm standing here today, and I love my wife dearly, as I'm standing here today, I have no earthly idea what her explanation was because I was too busy trying to figure out how I'm going to explain to her that this is important. Because as adults, we have broken brains. But as kids, we didn't do that. We listened to everything, mostly because we were afraid of getting in trouble, getting detention, missing recess, whatever, but we listened to everything. As adults, we don't. And we have to get back to that. In order to do this work, we absolutely have to get back to that. So, 
Um, and by the way, I'm going really fast. We don't have a whole ton of time. But if you guys have questions, I want you to throw them out. It makes my job easier. Um, so I've always struggled with the word technique. The word technique has always been an issue for me. A few years ago when I was in Sweden, I met a woman that was part of the group in Milwaukee that started the Solution Folks approach. Her name was Eve Lipchick. And Eve Lipchick and I had a conversation about how she believed that in the early days of Solution Focus work, they made a huge, horrible mistake. And it's our generation's job to correct this mistake. And what she said was, they thought that everyone knew, this was in the late 70s, that everyone knew that therapy took place within a conversation. That everybody knew that therapy took place within a relationship. So they didn't write about it. So when they started doing these Solution Focus things, all they wrote about was the techniques. The miracle question, exception finding, scaling questions, all of these things. So if you fast forward 30 years, people began to think that that's all solution-focused therapy was, was some sort of series of techniques, and it's not. So much so that I absolutely can't stand the word technique. I like the word invitation more, because these questions should much more be viewed as invitations. I'm asking questions to invite the client into a conversation about a given topic or description. They don't even have to be answered out loud. I worked with a kid once, really popular football player kid. His parents caught him doing some pretty deviant things and caused him to come to therapy. Is this buzzing thing? I'm, I'll unplug it. Just, I, I'll unplug it. So uh, these parents ca caused him to come to therapy. And I was asking my normal set of questions, and he was not an agreeable client. He was not the type of client that was terribly interested in answering these questions. He later explained to me, which I'll get to in a second, that he didn't like me because he viewed therapy as punishment for his behavior that he didn't think he deserved. But I don't know how to do my job any other way. So even though you're being difficult, I kept asking these questions because it's the only thing I know how to do. She's making the feedback go down. That was good. Okay. Sorry. No, no, it's good. I'm just working. It's fine. <laughs> no. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. But anyway, so this kid. I don't know how to do my job any other way, so I keep asking him questions. And he's giving me no responses that make me feel like that this is going well whatsoever. He had a huge football game once, and he came to my office and he said, would you mind asking me those questions, but only about the football game? I said, okay, so suppose you woke up on this day, and it was the beginning of a day where you were going to play the best football game of your life. What would you notice? And he walked me through this game up until the end of the first play of the game. He said, thanks. And that was it. The next time he came, he went back to being the difficult teenager, causing his parents and telling his parents that you're wasting your money. We don't need to talk to this guy. I don't need this. Again, I don't know what to do, so I keep doing my job. I saw this kid and went through conversations like that six times. Only one felt in any way productive, and that was the one where he asked me to talk to him about this football game. Finally, the dad calls me and he says, should we keep coming? And I said, please, save me from this misery. No. <laughs> said, no, no, no. I mean, if, if he's not finding it helpful, we don't, have to, we don't have to meet. And he said, okay, we're going to cancel our next visit. So a year goes by. I get an email from the dad saying, this kid, I'll call him Johnny. This kid is now in college. He's coming home for the summer break, and he wants to talk to you. Would you be willing to meet with him? Which I found odd, because he never wanted to talk to me. And nothing in the words he used in my, in my room made me think he liked anything about me or my room. Then he said, I want to talk to you. So he comes into my office, and he's carrying a notebook. And he said, um, can I tell you what's happened since we last met? And I said, sure. And he said, you know, I didn't like you, because I viewed <laughs> Kids can be honest. <laughs> He said, I didn't like you because I viewed you as punishment for what I was doing at the time, and I didn't want to be here. But I got in some real trouble that I couldn't tell my parents about a couple months after we met. And I said, oh, wow, how did you solve it? And he said, I started asking, answering the questions you asked me. And I wrote the answers down in my notebook. And he had this notebook, can I share it with you? I said, yeah, remember, these questions don't have to be answered out loud. They're kind of like question hand grenades. I threw them at them, they went off later. He had this notebook. I get goosebumps now thinking about it. And he reads off some of his answers. And it was almost as if we were doing therapy in his head as he was writing down these answers. 
So I said, well, what brings you in today? How can I be most helpful today? And he said, I'm now faced with another challenge, and I need a new set of questions because the old questions aren't helping me. <laughs> and I asked him a new set of questions. He wrote down every question I asked him. I mean, we had a conversation as we were doing. He wrote down every question I asked him. And then on his way out, he said, thank you. I said, oh, you're very welcome. You've been my money. You know, interesting. <laughs> He said, no, no, thank you, because I've changed my major to psychology, because now I want to be a counselor. Mm. This kid didn't want to be in my office, and later wants to become a counselor. And that was just a couple of months ago. It was this particular summer where he came home for that summer. Wow. So we're, these questions don't even have to be answered out loud. My job is just ask the questions, because sometimes they'll go off later. <clears throat> and because we view these questions as invitations, the normal rules of invitations apply. I have to invite you respectfully, nicely, using common language, using your worldview, and I'm not trying to get you to do anything, because once I do that, then the normal rules of oppression apply. You guys talk to adolescents quite a bit. What happens when you try to get them to do anything? Even if it's something good for them, they dig their heels in the sand. Test this. I have a nephew, and I was toying with him. I said, I'm going to make you eat ice cream today. And he went, no. Wait, what? What? Because <laughs> they don't even realize that I'm asking you to do something good for you. Once you try to mandate someone do something, they immediately apply pressure to not do that very thing. So I'm not trying to get my clients to do anything. I'm simply building a conversation and trusting within the realm of that conversation, healing will take place. I like this quote by a guy named David Rock. Focusing on problems lead us to the past. Focusing on problems leads to blame, excuses, justification. It's complicated and slow and often drains our mental energy. Focus on solutions, however, immediately creates energy in our minds. We can now prove this with neuroscience. When someone is thinking about possibilities and happiness, their brain scan looks different versus when they're thinking about problems and sadness. Your brain literally changes and becomes more creative and more open to things when you're thinking happy thoughts. This is one of the reasons I think solution-focused therapy is so powerful. Sorry, more buzzing, but I'll unplug it. Yeah, right. The best description of curiosity that I've ever seen. He respectfully invited her into a conversation where she would describe in detail what a pear tastes like. Now, have anybody ever heard a better description of what a pear would taste like? <laughs> no. But he used language to respectfully invite that person into the conversation and they subsequently can do it. <clears throat> so there's one rule when you're doing these exercises, and also when you're working with clients, and that rule is the interviewer is 100% responsible for asking useful questions. As a, as a therapist, that's my job. My job is to ask questions that produce useful answers, and that is 100% my job. If I fail to get useful answers, I fail to ask questions that would produce them and the client gets all of the credit for those useful answers. I don't get any credit for it, okay? I ask good questions, they give useful answers. My job is to ask the questions, their job is to give the answers, and they get all of the credit. Now, when we're doing solution-focused work, it's so focused on details that a lot of times we do these things that we call solution-focused lists, which is really, really important for you guys to understand when you're working with adolescents and, and clients. Now, a lot of times in my office, I have a whiteboard. And if you want to scare the mess out of a kid, put a blank whiteboard on your wall, and then start numbering it. Because kids get freaked out. Like, what is that? I worked with a kid the other day. He walked in, and I put 1 through 20 on the whiteboard, and I could totally see him freak out. What are we going to do? Well, tell me 20 things that you've done since we last met that made you happy. Oh, man, we're only going to get to 3 or 4 or whatever. But we do this because the number drives the process of thinking. People ask me a lot, like, why do you do 20 or 30? I will do as many as the clock allows. I've recently consulted with a professional sports team. Well, not recently, but a while ago. I've consulted with a professional sports team. And we spent the whole day going number one through 250 signs that this team would have a successful season. So nothing can stop this process of thinking except the clock. The number must represent a challenge, but not so large that the person would feel defeated. Like, I wouldn't say to this kiddo that we have to do 250 in an hour. Because I don't want them to feel defeated, but I want them to think. 
because we, we have to go to deeper levels in our thought, and we typically don't do this about happiness. If I ask somebody, like, how would you know you were having a good day, I'll get very broad answers initially, like, I'd wake up happy. That's a very broad, general answer. But if I ask somebody, how would you know you were having a bad day, they would be very specific. Right? I would be crying, I'd have a pit in my stomach feeling, those sorts of things. And we want to reverse that. Like, I want the details of the happiness, and the only way to do that is to drive the thinking in that direction, because we typically don't actually do that. And somehow, making the list it makes it more concrete. Writing it down makes the list more concrete. I've noticed, <coughs> when I started doing this, this was before kind of the technology boom, but almost always, people will get up and take a picture of the list we make on the wall. Now, I told you, when I was doing cognitive behavioral therapy, and specifically multi-systemic therapy, working here at MHMR, no one ever asked me to see my progress notes, or any note I was taking during the session. But now, at least weekly, someone asks me for what I was writing down while we were talking. I keep a stack of note cards on my desk, and I will typically, at the end of the session, kind of jot down my thought before I give client feedback. And I would honestly say about half of my clients ask me for that note card. But when I was doing a more problem-focused way of working with clients, no one ever asked me for the notes. Because people didn't want to know the problem-focused part of themselves. They want to know the better parts of themselves. And now that we spend so much more time talking about the best parts of themselves and what life would look like when they use them, they want to see them. They want to have them. They want to take it with them. Right? Does that make sense? So. <clears throat> The next part, and the first thing I want you guys to kind of walk out here with is this idea of preferred future and having conversations with people about the way they'd like their future to look like. I would probably say that Solution Focused Therapy is most famous for this. Uh, the most prominent question associated with this is, of course, the miracle question. But a good preferred future needs to be concrete and observable. I sometimes teach a practicum class, and I was one time teaching a class and we were talking about this idea of preferred future, and the student said, I got a great tape of me going over preferred future with a client. He said, oh, okay, well, let's watch it. He puts in the tape, and the client describes that in the future, he would be melding his two halves together. Well, that's great, but it's not concrete or observable, right? I can't see you melding your two halves together. So it's important that the thing must be observable and concrete. It must be mathematically positive meaning it's about the presence of something as opposed to the absence of something. The two most important words in using solution-focused therapy are suppose, because it invites clients into a conversation about the future, and instead of, because it turns absence of language into the presence of language. So very often I'd say, suppose tomorrow your life is the way you wanted it to be, how would you notice? And people would say, I wouldn't be depressed. Right? That's about the absence of depression. When solution focused therapy, we'd say, what would you be instead? And then they would tell us about the presence of something and then the way we would go. It's obviously future focused. It's about tomorrow and not yesterday. And this is very important because sometimes clients come to our office focused on yesterday. So how would you know that this was helpful for us? Well, I would be over the trauma that happened to me in the past. So we have to turn it into present focused or future focused language. So if tomorrow you were over this event that happened in the future, what would be happening next? So now we're talking about the future, we're talking about the presence of their, of their success as well as the absence of their problem. And it's realistic, even if unlikely. I'm not here to assess if something can happen or not. It's just, is it realistic? Can it happen in the realm of possibility? Remember my example of Roger Bannister. No one had ever done it before, ever. But once we knew it was possible, it changed the way we perceived this goal, and now 20,000 people have done it requires effort. This is so important to me because people seem to think, you know, I do a lot of my work with couples and families, and it shocks me how often we attribute success to a random act of karma and failure to our personal flaws. So if someone does something successfully, I say, like, how did you do that? Oh, I don't know, stars lined up. <laughs> Truthfully. Yeah. I ask people about their relationships, the beginning of their relationships, it's so interesting to me. I, I can't think of a better word. I ask people how they started their relationship and they say, oh, it's like Cuba just hit me. Oh, really? <laughs> so what happened that caused you guys to get into some trouble? I cheat a lot. 
I'm a liar. Okay. Well, I don't want you people to do that. Like, we have to recognize that our successes require just as much effort with our personal positive attributes as our failures do. But we don't tend to do that. Kids are notorious at this. You guys ever ask a kid? This is my favorite thing about kids, you know, we talk about the idea of exceptions and solution-focused work. My favorite thing about kids is I've yet to meet a kid who is equally bad all throughout the school day. Right? There's always one class where the kid finds a way to get along better. But if you ask that kid why he does it, he'll say, well, in so-and-so's class, I'm bad. I talk too much. I can't sit still. Well, why are you different than the other class? Because they like me. It's not their effort that's causing it. My effort is causing the success. It's theirs. And we have to have them attribute their success to their own effort. Because once we know that, we can use it. When we become aware of our traits, we use them. It's just up to us which trait we're going to be more aware of. Most people, I'm included, I would assume most of you are included, we're more aware of, aware of our flaws than we are our talents. And as humans, we use the skills we're most aware of. You guys who work in schools, I saw several hands go up. Parents program kids to fail every day in school. You guys know how they do this? They drop the kid off and they say, don't you let me hear from the tool counselor, don't you call, don't you, and the kid's now programmed to think of his flaws. And he has no choice but to use them. We need to reverse that, and the solution folks therapy will do it. And it's recognized as having a desirable impact on others. If something gets better within me, then something will get better in other people, right? The best thing about solution focused therapy is the person who actually needs the help doesn't have to be the one that comes into the office. I worked with a kid pretty recently. I asked him what his best hope for from treatment, and he said, you can't help me with the thing that I want. I said, you're probably right, but give me a shot. And he said, I need my parents to stop drinking, right? I need my parents to stop drinking. He's a pretty young kid, 13-ish. I need my parents to stop drinking. So I asked him a series of really stupid questions. If your parents somehow stopped drinking, what would be different about you? And he starts describing himself living in a sober home. This kid had a really, really tough life having two parents that drank a lot. His parents would pass out in the garage, and they thought he didn't know they were drinking. I asked him, what would be different about your life if all of a sudden your parents were sober and doing a proper job of taking care of you? We had a very wonderful, very detailed conversation about the presence of his better self when his parents were not drinking. Three weeks later, his parents called me and asked me if I'd help them stop drinking. And they both went into treatment and sent him to go live with his aunt and uncle. Why does that happen? Because happiness is contagious. When we start living our better selves, it spreads throughout the home. We know that's true because so is negativity. Negativity is equally as contagious. So so is positivity. This particular couple, three weeks later, contacted me and asked for help to go get treatment. They went off to go to two different treatment places and sent this kid to go live with his aunt and uncle by the way to detox. Why? Because happiness is powerful stuff. Two weeks ago, I talked to a girl who told me secretly that she was using ecstasy every single day. And, by the way, didn't see a problem with it. Her explanation was, well, it's not heroin. <laughs> Solid logic, right? You guys ever hear teenagers talk like that? It's not heroin. I suppose you're correct. <laughs> she asked me not to tell her parents. And I found myself really struggling. So don't tell my parents. Hey, okay? are you in any danger right now? She said no. But I don't intend to stop. I don't care to stop. Don't tell my parents. But I remember this idea that if, if recognized having a positive impact on others. Solution-focused therapy, positivity is a very powerful thing. So I asked her, being kind of sly therapist that I am, can we have a conversation with your parents in the room? And she said yes. So, and this was the first time I'd ever done it. I met with her two or three times individually. Her parents come in the room, actually stepdad and mom. They come in the room, I start asking questions. By the end of the conversation, she asked her mother to take her to treatment. The mother left my office and drove her to a place in Canton, Texas, where she is currently sitting in treatment right now. And she started that conversation with, not only am I not going, but I don't see a problem with this. But once we started talking about the presence of everybody's preferred future, she chose it. I didn't have to make her do it. Remember, I'm not trying to get the client to do anything. I'm just trusting that the conversation will lead to where the client would like to be. <clears throat> and it's detailed. You can never have too many details. 
the details are what drive the change. You can't have a detailed description about a preferred future and not accidentally steer your lives in that direction. I learned to drive in the worst city in America, and maybe even in the world, to learn to drive, and that's Boston, Massachusetts. Anybody ever been to Boston, Massachusetts? Let me tell you how I got treated as a student driver. As a student driver in Boston, Massachusetts, the, city, the, the wonderful city folk throw coins at the student driver car. It's like target <laughs> practice. That, that little bumper sticker on the back of the car that says student driver, they throw things at that car. They honk flip middle finger. The, the roads are still meant for horse carriages. They're very hilly. And I'm freaking the bleep out in this car. And I had this lady who was to this day the meanest human being I've ever met sitting in the passenger seat of the car. And she had those brakes. We call them jackrabbit brakes. I don't know if you guys have these cars. So she could apply brakes whenever the hell she wanted to. So every now and then, I'd be driving down the street and then and she would jam on the brakes. So I turned to her, like, stop it. I'm begging you to stop it. People throwing things, flipping out, I'm having a hard time. And she said, I'm not going to let you kill me in this car. Every time your eyes turn away from the front, I'm going to jam on these brakes. Wow. So I asked her why. I said, why would you do that? And she said something that sticks with me to this very day. Your hand, something I experienced this morning. Your hands follow where your eyes go. So I'm 16 years old. I'm like, no, that's not true. And we go to this empty street, she said, put your hands at 10 and 2, and go straight, and I'll prove to you that this happens. So here we are, we're going straight, she says, now look out the passenger window. And I look out, and sure enough, she's right. Mm -hmm. I start kind of veering in this direction. And I get really irritated, I know I can do it, I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> she said, now look out the driver window, and sure enough, I start veering to this, this side of the road. We know this is true, because that's what creates rubberneck traffic. If there's a bad accident on that side of the road, everybody looks, they swerve, then they have to hit the brakes to self-correct, and that creates traffic on my side of the road, right? Well, the same thing is true in our lives. Our lives steer towards our perception. So when we use details about the better parts of our lives, you can't help but be different. With that teenage girl, we had a conversation about the better part of herself, and she had no choice. She had tranced herself into wanting help. So by the time the conversation was over, she was asking to go to treatment. Because once we start looking, our hands follow, and they just can't help it. If I had more time, I'd show you another tape I have uh, of, a, of a client that I worked with. First and only time I met with her, I didn't know it, but she had a hundred dollar a day heroin habit. We had an extremely detailed conversation about the presence of her better self, and two months later, her daughter calls me in tears saying that my mother's been clean since she met you, what did you do? I said, I can show you the tape, I didn't do anything. I asked her a bunch of questions, your mother fixed it, right? It's just because once we start focusing on the better parts of our lives, we just can't help it. Our lives steer in that direction. It's the realization of the client's best hopes. I want you guys to remove the question, what brought you here? Because that invites problem language. And replace it with a question like, what are your best hopes from coming here? Because that invites solution building language. And the task is to help the client consider and describe what life would look like with the best hopes present in as specific details as possible. The more detail, the more clear the picture, and the more likely the client is to experience change in that direction. We literally can't help it. Anybody in here cook? If you cook, I cook a lot. Uh, my favorite thing to cook is Italian food. Like I said, I grew up in Boston. My best, one of my best friend's uh, grandmothers was one of those Italian grandmothers that used to freeze meatballs and mail them to us when we were in college. <laughs> I know. I know. And I'm about to tell you something about me that's going to make you guys like wonder if I have a single brother, because what I'm about to tell you is really cool. <laughs> so the Italian grandmother that would make these meatballs, she wanted to teach my, one of my close friends how to make these meatballs, and he was not interested. And she was really emotional about it, so I said, I'll learn. So he teaches me how to make homemade noodles, sauce, meatballs, all these Italian dishes. So in college, I used to cook for all my friends. I go, I'd make all these meals, and you know, in Italian food, you can make a big trough, and I can just give it away, all that stuff. So one of my best friends starts, uh, while I was writing the first book, he starts dating this girl, and he calls me, and he says, uh, can you walk me through how to make that sauce? Because I want to impress this girl. 
So I'm like, yeah, man, I don't have a ton of time, but I'll be happy to. I get on the phone, and he's like a cooking... He, he can't do it, right? <laughs> I lived with him. I used to have to microwave his pizza for him. Like, <laughs> this kid's just the problem. So I have to walk through every minute detail. Like, get a bowl this size. Make sure you put this much water in, all that stuff. By the time I was done telling him about the recipe this for lasagna, I was craving lasagna. Because whatever we focus on in that great of detail, our brains want to experience. Milton Erickson would say, this is why human beings are susceptible to trance. Because when we focus on the details of something, we start perceiving it, even if it's not present. So we're focusing on details here to get a very clear picture, and the more likely the client is to make a change. And it involves other perspectives. So it's not just the way you would see the world if your life got better, but it's the way the other people in your world would see you if those best hopes that we were talking about became present. So I want to show you me working with a kiddo named Brandon. Let me know if the, if the buzzing noise is too And then it's as bad as it's ever been. <laughs> Very true. Very, very true. We do it without reflection. Like, I'm not saying what I think about it. I'm not saying, oh, that sounds good, or do more of that, or any of that stuff. I'm just asking for the detailed uh, conversation. Right? Nothing nothing more. Anything else stand out to you? Non judgmental. Non judgmental? Mm -hmm. Absolutely true. Yes? It's hard for us to get to Tamar's hand. Numbers out there, like, <laughs> yeah. So you put that number on it, really does mean you have to like, you can throw out the first few, and you really have to push through to get to the number. That's totally true. You really have to think. And when we do that, almost every time, it looks like a, like a downward, like a hill kind of. Because the first one is usually really narrow, but because we have to think, 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 as you're saying, the bottom one is going to require lots of description uh, of detail. There we go. Anything else stand out to you as you were doing it before we go any further? How are we doing? We have 30 minutes left, and uh, we haven't taken a break. Is that okay? Can I, can I keep going? I don't know if people normally take breaks or whatever. Okay. Um, so, we are better than we think we are. We're more aware of our flaws. That's such an important thing to realize. We're more aware of our flaws. And we tend to use the attributes we know most about. This is super duper important. So which would you rather know about? If I'm going to use what I know more about, it would be in my best interest to learn more about my talents. When I was in high school, I had the best baseball coach a kid could ever ask for. His name, we called him Coach P. His name was Peter Pescarosa. Coach P. And in 1992, when I started playing high school baseball, Coach P used to videotape our batting sessions. And this was before you could record on everything digitally. So he went through effort to do this. VHS, the big tripod thing. He would go home and he would edit the entire team's batting practice so that each player only got to watch their best swings. I was 15 years old, and I said, Coach, why are you doing that? Like, I hit for five minutes, you just showed me three swings. <laughs> and he said, because I just want you to see the best ones. And I said, why? And I'll never forget his response. He said, because those are the only ones I want you to repeat. Mm -hmm. Because of playing for a guy like that, I went way beyond where I probably should have gone athletically. Because he never let me think about flaws. Now, Coach P was a hot-headed Italian from Boston. So every now and then, he would yell at you real bad. <laughs> he, but he never, ever, ever criticized a single player in the years that I played for Coach P. Not once. Because his philosophy was, I want you to repeat the good things. So when you did something well, he let you know about it. He would video record it in 1992 and make you sit in the classroom and watch it. A little high school in Franklin, Massachusetts. So when I got to college and I started playing athletics, I literally didn't know that other people had flaws. I didn't know that, because my coach didn't talk to me in that way. 
I thought we were the best baseball players in the world because that's the only way that we had been talked to. And it allowed me to go as far as I possibly could athletically. And in solution-focused therapy, kids come in the room, they have PhDs in their problems. People have been telling them about their problems forever and a day. They know everything there is to possibly know about their problem. So I need them to get back in touch with their attributes. Several years ago, around the time when I was learning solution-focused therapy, I told you guys, and it's true, my clients taught me to trust the language. It wasn't a professor, it was my clients. And I was talking to this very good running back, this high school running back. And I asked him what skills he used to become a good athlete, making another list similar to what we were doing before. And he said, I'm fast and I'm strong. And I'm thinking, man, you must be much more than that to be as good at high school football as you are in Texas. And I said to this kid, do you realize, and this is true, by the way, do you realize that if you play high school football in Texas, you're in the top percentage in the world at this sport? Right? American football is not played all over the place. And if you play high school football in Texas, Ohio, Oklahoma, California, Florida, you're pretty good. This kid kind of stood up really strange and said, what, is it, what do you have? Like, what makes you good at this? And eventually he said something that struck me as odd. He said, I'm a really good decision maker. But really? Can you explain how being a really good decision maker helps you on the football field? And he said, part of my responsibility as a running back is I have to pass protect on pass plays. And sometimes if the opposing team blitzes, I have to decide which one I'm going to block. I said, how do you do that? And he said, I picked the inside guy because he has the quickest route to the quarterback. The outside guy has to run further, so it gives the quarterback more time to throw the ball. Now, tell me that kid's not thinking. This is a kid who had made horrible decisions in his life. He's now describing himself as a good decision maker. And I happen to just say, would you be willing to practice this good decision making that you do on a field every Friday night in school and just see who notices? And he said, yeah, I'll try that. A couple weeks later, the guidance counselor, what we call guidance counselor, school counselor, calls me and says, this kid has completely changed. Can I tell you what he did? I said, yeah. He wrote a message to himself in his locker, in his school locker, not his athletic locker, in his school locker, about how to make good decisions throughout the day. And between every class, he went back to his locker, read that message, and then went to his class. And done getting in trouble. But he had this ability to make decisions this whole time. He just didn't know it. Everybody was talking about talking to him as if he couldn't make decisions, when he clearly could. And once we invited that into the room, he had no choice. Once he knew he had it, he had to use it, because we used the attributes we know more about. He walked into my room with a PhD about his problems, and he left with a bachelor's degree about his successes. But that's what he had to use. He had no choice. So we're going to do another quick exercise about learning how to use strength in conversation. Same groups of three, same thing, interview, interviewee, observer. And we don't have a whole ton of time, but instead of 15, let's do 10. So what 10 personal qualities do you possess that make you good at your job? And if those qualities played a bigger role for you in the future, how would you know? How would you know this? Okay? So interviewer, ask the interviewee what 10 personal qualities. You have to say what else, because 10's a lot. And if those qualities play a bigger role for you in the future tomorrow, how would you notice it? Last thing, the last of the three things we talked about, um, using people's strengths, we talked about for the future. Now we're going to talk about change, the idea and process of change. Now, greater amounts of change take place when we spend more time talking about change as opposed to talking about problems. Right? When we talk about change, change happens. When we identify specifically the type of change we're looking for, then that particular change is more likely to happen. Makes total sense, but think about how often we don't do that. We talk about change, change happens, versus complaining or talking about problems we're specific in the change we're talking about, then that particular change happens. This makes me think a lot about prayer. Now, I don't know how many people are religious, 
But I'm a pretty spiritual guy, and I gotta tell you something that happened about specificity that I never really forgot and still causes me to think about to this very day when I'm doing solution focused work. Now I was <clears throat> my very first job in this field, not as a clinician, but when I was an undergrad, I worked at a place called Volunteers of America. And at Volunteers of America, they had uh, there was part of it was a was a halfway house. Does somebody work there now? But you know where it is, you know what it is. Part of it was a halfway house, and the other half was a treatment center. And the treatment center, once a month, people from this church would come and give lectures to the people that were in recovery. And I was really like addicted to human resilience. So I would ask these people, can I sit in on the groups? And they were like, yes. So I'd sit in the corner and just watch these, like, these amazing stories. So one day, you know, I, I, I'm from a place where I didn't have anything. My family was very, very poor. It was just a difficult childhood. So I happened to say to one of the guys in this church that I was looking for a car. And he said, what kind of car do you want? Now at the time, I wanted a Honda Prelude. Like the mid-90s version of a Honda Prelude, kind of boxy, and it's like the, the long light across the back. And this guy said to me, like, well, let's pray so that you would get a Honda Prelude. And I said, okay. I guess, <laughs> I guess that sounds okay to me. And a really nice guy, he said, stick your hands out, so I do. And he puts his hands gently on top of mine, and he says a prayer of thanks for my Honda Prelude. And I'm thinking in my head, like, maybe he's not understanding. I don't have <laughs> <laughs> But we go through this prayer of thanks about the Honda Prelude. And years later, well, not too, too many years, but a couple of years later, Honda Preludes changed their body style. And I hated the new version of the Honda Prelude. I was like, dang it, I can't get this Honda Prelude. So I got my first job in the field, and I go to the Honda store, and I'm looking around, and the new Accord now looked like the old Prelude. And I bought it, I drove home, and I get out of the car, and I walk behind it, and I realize the very thing I had envisioned, I now own. And I'm not sure that I would have envisioned it to that much depth had he not walked me through that exercise. Because when we think about change with specificity, that change is more likely to happen. Now, I can't fully explain why, but I can tell you about what research we do, this is true. Right? This is absolutely true. <clears throat> so what's our role in this change process? We actually can impact others' change. We actually have that ability. We can impact others' change. I used to, uh, in my previous training of cognitive behavioral work, when someone would come to the office and say, like, in essence, why are you here? And someone would say, because my husband needs to get better, or my wife needs to get better, or my kids need to get better. We would hear that as a wrong answer, like, you need to use I statements. Well, that's not really true, because you can impact other people's behavior. Think of that young kid that impacted the sobriety of his parents. His parents are now sober because he chose to go through this process. And his life impacted the presence of their problem. When you talk about change, change happens. When you talk about specific change, then that specific change is more likely to occur. There is one last exercise that we don't have time to do, so I'm going to tell you about it. By the way, these are all exercises that I'm likely to do with clients at times, so I want you guys to experience this is helpful. And this exercise we call 2020. When someone comes to my office, and kids do this all the time, like, I don't have a problem with my bloody parents. Well, if I said, if your parents were to change, tell me 20 things you would notice about them. Kids will jump at this. They would do this, 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 and this. And they feel so proud of themselves. Now go tell my parents to do that. But then when I ask this question, then if those 20 things were likely to happen, what 20 responses would your parents get from you? They're not so happy anymore. <laughs> but they will still have this conversation with me and they start to somehow understand. Maybe I'm in the problem cycle with them. And by doing this, I can enter into the solution cycle. Somehow we readily accept that problems spiral downhill. But we don't as easily understand that so does happiness. So does success. So does solutions. They spiral just as easily in the opposite direction. So when kids get going this way, they come back the next week and they say, my parents did it. 
and we didn't even ask them to. They just had to respond to your responses because it's a different cycle. It's a different feedback loop. Right? In the field of family therapy, they did a lot of research in this thing called feedback loops. It's a different feedback loop. So I told you earlier, um, actually, all of this stuff we call listening with a solution focused ear. We're listening for signs of strength, evidence of resource, evidence of past successes, further detail of what the client wants, details of life before or without the problem. All of those things are what we're sitting and listening to clients doing. That's the process of listening with a solution focused ear. So the last thing I want to show you guys is Brandon. So this is Brandon in the second session. So remember, I showed you guys this change. I showed you guys how we, how we just shifted in a noticeable way. I'm going to show you the beginning of the session, and I made a horrible mistake. Brandon comes in, and he said, I got something I want to show you. And I said, oh, okay, can you show me after? So as a result, Brandon, did, he knew we were recording it, but he didn't want to show me this thing on tape. So Brandon sh sits off camera just waiting to do this thing. Okay? But I'm too stupid to realize that, so I just let Brandon sit off camera for the whole session. But you can hear it. <laughs> thing that was previously calling, causing hours of fun is now a source of pride for them. And he changed it without asking, no one asked him to change it, he just changed it. He removed violence and cursing, and mom was able to participate in it, and she spent two weeks just praising it. He previously described his mom as all she does is yell at me and tell me what I'm doing wrong. She spent two weeks praising it and everything changed. They subsequently canceled that, um, that visit two weeks later. He did get himself back on the football team. He was in an alternative school for alternative schools. I didn't know they had those, but, <laughs> yes. but, but that's where he was. Uh, six months later, he was back at his regular school playing football. Um, the last time I heard from him, he called me to see if I would come to one of his games, and I was out of the country, I couldn't come. And then we just met those two times. So, we don't have time. So this is how you guys can find me. Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. Yes? Do you always have a parent in the room with your child? That's a really good question. Um, I typically walk out in my lobby, and whoever stands up and is willing to come back, that's who I'm willing to talk with. I, like, when I was doing my original family therapy training, they would say, like, you know, get the whole family in the room. But sometimes families weren't constructed that way. And I also don't want to tell people how I need to have this conversation. So I walk in my lobby and typically say something open-ended like, you guys ready? And whoever stands up, that's who, that's who comes back. And with them, they, they both came in. And I will often ask, like, is this okay? And if the kiddo or mom wants to change it, I, you're happy to change it. And usually people want it like that because we're talking about awesome things. So I'd like my mom here because you keep asking me good questions. There's a movie called... Uh, Kevin Bacon movie about Alcatraz. You guys ever seen this? Like Murder in the First. Murder in the First, I think it's called. And he said, "I'm not answering any questions to his attorney. I'm not asking anything." And the attorney puts him on the stand anyway. And he's sitting there, and he asked a question, and the judge stopped him. And the and the Kevin Bacon's character turns and says, "No, no, no. He asked me the right question. I want to answer." Well, that's what it's like. I'm not asking them questions that they wouldn't want to talk about from their parents, so they typically would allow it. Good question. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Can you get the um, slide that has the, like, if we want to download the slideshow? Yes. What's that web address? Which one? You, oh, oh, yes, yes. The one you showed? Ooh, yes. Uh, Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay, I wanted it to. <laughs> Elliotspeaks.com slash thank you for There you go. <laughs> yes, I should have it memorized, but there it is right there. Um, those will be there, along with some other things. I, I tend to put articles I've written, um, sometimes PDF versions of books, and um, all my PowerPoint slides. So when you guys go to this page, you'll see this PowerPoint slide and a few other things, and you're welcome to have all of it. Just don't, just don't disperse it anywhere, please. Um, 
but you're welcome to have all of them. Elliot, do you have room for your Edgar Conference? There are limited seats available, uh, so if people would pick up flyers in the back of the room, uh, this conference is really going to be pretty cool. There's never been an event like this that focused specifically on being and doing solution-focused work with couples. And we're going to be talking about research. There are going to be workshops about different aspects of working with couples. And then uh, two of the best clinicians and researchers in the world, Adam Frower and Sarah Smock, will be here. Or Sarah Smock Jordan, she's probably married, uh, will be here talking about their work. So if anybody's interested, this is going to be a really cool event. August uh, 9th and 10th, it's a Friday and a Saturday. So I hope you guys would uh, consider coming. Where, where is it? Oh, it's going to be in North Fort Worth at the Holiday Inn. Just uh, like the Meacham exit, just north of downtown. And buy my book. <laughs>